have a literally electrifying effect on our brains. So just imagine the charge accumulated by the trillions of books produced since the dawn of the reading revolution. Libraries like this one provide, if you like, the raw material for all of that. Thousands of books, countless words, facts, stories, ideas, all the products of other minds packaged up and waiting to be transferred into our own and used by them. But the appetite for knowledge that generated mass literacy has spawned brand new media that some believe challenge the status of reading itself. In the last century, radio, then television, the analogue media, had by the 1960s begun to dominate leisure time. The rise of television above all provoked anxieties that traditional pastimes, including reading, would suffer. And it's true that the number of hours we spend in front of the screen has been rising ever since. Well, it would seem that these anxieties have proved unfounded. Here in Britain, many of us remain enthusiastic readers. In 2005, to take just one year, we bought 218 million books. That's a 30% rise since the mid-1990s. It might even be the case that television, with its classic serials, has made us read even more. But since the beginning of the 21st century, the spectacular rise of digital technologies like the internet and video games have brought a fresh wave of fears in their wake. In the United States, exposed to digital media for longer, surveys of reading habits back up these concerns. In 2007, the prestigious National Endowment for the Arts published a major survey that showed that in the United States, book sales have stagnated. Reading was at risk, the report concluded, with severe consequences for American society. Most worryingly, among young adults, there were marked falls in reading proficiency. The steepest declines were in reading for literary experience, meaning exploring themes, characters and settings. And that's the reading that matters. In the last five years, you see our fourth graders decoding at a wonderful level. They're doing better than ever before, while our middle schoolers and our high schoolers are flattening or declining in their comprehension skills. It's not just an American anxiety. In Britain, Baroness Susan Greenfield, director of the Royal Institution, has become an outspoken critic of digital media. She's convinced that they threaten the traditional values of reading. When you think about it, what happens when you read? The author, the authority, takes you by the hand and you go on a journey. Someone is guiding you. They're taking you from a beginning to a middle to an end. Now, it might not be a journey you like, or that you agree with, but for sure, intellectually, you end up in a different place from where you started. You've gone on your journey. Now, because the human mind will evaluate everything that happens in terms of previous experiences, because that's what plasticity is, it's the formation of connections that enables you to navigate the world, so it will be with this journey you've just been on. There's one ingredient of the digital revolution that especially troubles Professor Greenfield, video games. The whole difference between, let's say, computer games, which emphasise process, here and now experience, the thrill of pretty much instant gratification as you win the princess or slay the dragon, is very different from reading, which focuses on content, on narrative. And my own view is it is content, it is meaning, whether it has seen one thing in terms of something else, a narrative that gives a meaning to life beyond the here and now. But is Susan Greenfield right? Does gaming satisfy just instant gratification? And does it really deny the values of traditional storytelling? This is the game base in Piccadilly, a paradise for video game enthusiasts. I wanted to ask these gamers what they think. What's the aim of it? What should you do? It's just to kill people. <laughs> kill each other, really. 
in order to do this, you have to get yourself a bit worked up and a bit, I would have thought, a bit angry just to yeah, do you, it. Yeah, you can get quite frustrated with, um, you know, if, if you've just been killed, yeah. like, you know, things like that. But um, after the game, obviously, you just calm down. Some people say that spending a lot of time doing this kind of thing actually alters your mind and makes you into a different type of person. Do you think there's anything in I, that? I can see that happening. Do you think, and amongst the friends and amongst the people you know, do you think it's an either or thing, that either you're on the computer or reading books? I think nowadays, well, I don't think many people read as, not as much as before. Why do you think that is? Because it's easier to just play a game, isn't it? You, know? you have to exert yourself as much. These vox pops don't add up to scientific evidence, and they don't reflect the intensely social and often cooperative nature of much online gaming. But according to Greenfield, if people choose to play games rather than read, they might lose that single most powerful effect of reading, empathy. When you play a computer game to rescue the princess, the princess is meaningless. You don't care about the princess, do you? You don't care about what she's feeling or thinking. She strikes no associations with you. She's something to be rescued as simply the prize, the end point of the game. Whereas when you read a book, you care about the princess. That's why you're reading the book, because you're caring about what she's feeling and thinking, what's going to happen to her. But not everyone agrees. Novelist Naomi Alderman won the Orange Award for New Writers with her book Disobedience, set in London's Orthodox Jewish community. Naomi also designs video games, most notably Perplex City, which is played by hundreds of gamers in an imaginary city of the future. Why do you think people are so worried about computers? I think people get very concerned about seeing their teenagers locked into playing video games and becoming very involved in them and that's all they want to do, play video games. But I would argue that that's really just a part of adolescence. And when we're adolescents, we get tremendously involved and tremendously interested in a whole range of things, you know, from girls who rush to the front of a, of a stage in order to see their favourite pop star and then collapse screaming because they love him so much, or when you're reading a novel as a teenager. I mean, there are, you never love a book as much as you love it when you're a teenager. Naomi is convinced that some video games can provide the same empathetic experience as a novel. There's a, a PlayStation 2 really classic game called Ico, which is, uh, it is a rescuing a princess from a tower. It's intensely empathetic. I defy anyone to watch five minutes or five seconds footage of this game without feeling tremendous empathy for this little girl. It's all done in the way that she's animated in her looking backwards in fear, in her, he has to sort of drag her by the hand to get her to come along with him. and. It's beautiful. All the character is done via the animation. So the question of whether digital media, including video gaming, will undermine traditional reading habits remains open. The evidence just isn't available yet. In the 5,000 years since our ancestors invented the alphabet, our brains have been on an amazing journey. Reading and writing were the foundations of the first civilizations. Five hundred years ago, the invention of the printing press began to shape the modern world. And the journey continues. Our reading habits may change as electronic media becomes as familiar as this process here, but reading itself will remain the key to a wider world, just as it was from the Bronte sisters in that Yorkshire vicarage. It gives us the chance to step into a, a bigger world and to see it in a different way. It can even transform lives. That's why today, as much as ever, reading matters. Reading's journey from an elitist pastime to every man's hobby in 